Good morning, guys. How you doing this morning? Good. 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 It has been a long time since we did one of these recordings, right? Quite a while, yeah. Been a minute. Pro- Providence has diverted us on two or three occasions here, so. That's for sure. That's for sure. Well, real quick, uh, ever since uh, we we did our last one, what what are what are one or maybe two main things that have been going on in 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 your lives? Some some huge huge things for for good or for maybe not so good. Who wants to go first? <laughs> Mike, you spoke first. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I guess what's been going on. I mean, the, the, our, our church family knows, but uh, for me. Uh, one of the major things is I had uh, that uh, outpatient surgery and re- have recovered for that. And I, I'm, I got two more weeks left on my recovery, but I'm able to start lifting uh, greater weights now, now and can get out and start running. So that's, that's good. And just uh, been able to um, uh, do a other reading. I mean, besides this, I've been reading a couple other books and it's just uh, trying to catch up and stay ahead of my reading. But uh and then made a trip down to North Carolina to visit uh, our youngest daughter and her family, and that was that was enjoyable as well. Nice. Yeah. You guys are very quiet today. Why are y'all so reserved? You haven't had enough coffee. Why well, No. Well, no. That's always a possibility, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I think we've forgotten how to do this. It's been so long. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, it's it's uh, the normal things apply. Um, in terms of my jobs, thing things are fairly quiet right now, uh, uh, and I don't know if that's if that's going to change or not. But uh, uh, even now, uh, praying about it and considering it, the more I look at the Social Security retirement table, uh, whether in October I'll I'll pull the trigger and finally get out altogether, but. Uh, that's not a done deal, but I would I would appreciate your prayers for that. That's a that's a huge step for us. And um, and, and um, the other thing is uh, just um, you know uh, for our family, uh, Karen and Rebecca uh, went out to to see the kids. Was it last week? No, Van, help me out here. Uh, you're the one that got scolded uh, for for not for not letting it be known. Uh, uh yeah I, th- I think it was because you were you yeah. were there wednesday night without right. karen yeah right right yeah. yeah yeah uh but but at any rate um continued prayers for them uh it's it's bridge building uh and I, the analogy i use is the old uh gwen's island bridge they've been working on that i've been here 22 may uh, memorial day will be 23 years and they've been tinkering with that bridge the whole 23 years I've been here, and they're still not done. So mm-hmm. uh, that kind of reminds me of the kind of uh, tinkering and and relationship building that we're having to do. So, mm. I guess for me, the work has picked up quite a bit. Uh, we've got um, a lot going on here in Gloucester County, and uh, I've also been assisting other jurisdictions with prosecutions. Um, so I mean, I've got a special prosecution going on in about four different jurisdictions right now. Mm. So not one special prosecution, four special prosecutions in four jurisdictions. So work's kind of gotten a lot busier. Um, and my wife has been able to go back to working uh, Sunday nights. So uh, that I know that was one of the reasons why we ended up having to move this to a Wednesday. So I'm really appreciative that we were able to do that. But um, other than that, things have, the Lord's been good. Um, yeah, blessing me with work and responsibility. So, well, you are being blessed with work, brother. I tell you <laughs> what, sure. any, any anytime I venture out of, out of my Sonata uh, in Gloucester County, I'm always thinking about you. I said, if somebody goes upside <laughs> my head, I know Will's going to go upside their head. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> Will is carrying the Romans 13 sword. Is that exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. And he bears it not in vain. That's right. That's yeah. right. All right. Well, why don't we plunge into our t- topic today? We, we've got a very interesting uh, topic today. We're looking at, uh, at at angels and demons. And, if you know, as I was thinking about this, there I don't think there's m- many subjects that have uh, produced 
as far as I know, um, as much fruitless debate through church history as angels and demons. I mean, when, when you think about it, uh, it's something that has been debated all throughout uh, church history. I know with the scholastics, you get to uh, to issues of uh, of speculation. Uh, you know, the old um, you know how, how many angels can dance on the head of a pen. Uh, Barbara, you probably remember that. I think that was like a, a guy by the name of Dunn Scotus who yeah, John, John Dunn Scotus yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. By, so, by, uh, by, by the way, one of our Scott, one of our I don't know if I'll call him a Scottish brother, but uh, <laughs> yeah, one of the uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, Scotland bright lights, as they think. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting as as you walk in Edinburgh, the statues you see. I mean, they're they're mm-hmm. they're they're real big on Adam Smith for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I mean, there's just a, a kind lot of timely. Of... I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. This is kind of timely too because we were actually in at uh, I was at the Cortez's community group on Sunday, and the there was a discussion about angels that came up and whether like the definition of angels and, and what they were, and uh, so I encourage them to tune into the podcast today because we'd be talking yeah. about angels and demons. Mike, I can't remember the specific question. Mike was there, but. Um. Yeah, it well, was a, I thought it was interesting that we were that came up, and I was like, "Hey, this is." Yeah, yeah. The, the, I think the thing was that, uh, from what I can remember, I believe um, Stephen was speaking more. Uh, I think he he brought up the 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 form of the the uh, demons and or not demons, the uh, angels, and uh, the guard the different types. The, 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 he, I think he mentioned the, the uh, cherubim and the seraphim. Uh, the right. seraphim. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So a very interesting topic. As a matter of fact, I remember uh, taking uh, Christian doctrine one and two in in seminary, and and we one of my friends was doing a paper on this. We could kind of choose what what doctrinal uh, point we wanted to do our our, our term papers for our, our course papers, and uh, and he told me that. There was this uh, theologian. Yeah, you'll know him, Marvin. I don't know if you, uh, Mike, you and Will might know him or not. But he's a he's a Baptist theologian by the name of Augustus Strong, and uh, wow. he was telling me that uh, that uh, Augustus Strong talked about uh, had a whole section in his theology on uh, when when he's talking about angels, he's talking about these medieval theologians and a very interesting thing that strong pointed out. And I actually, when I remember this this morning, I Googled it to see if I could find it. Cause I know, I mean, I got his theology there, but I w- didn't have time to start flipping through it, but I actually found it. And, and here, here's the quote, here's what Augustus strong said. Now, again, lots of speculation in the medieval times about angels. That's when it sort of, became extremely prominent. And here's what he says. He says, quote, uh, even the uh, excrements of angels were subjects of discussion. For if there was angels food, and if angels ate, Genesis 18, 8, it was argued that we must take the logical consequences. Is that not crazy? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that's Uh. just... Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, it gives new definition of dan- angels dancing on the head of a pen. <laughs> we I'll tell you what, well, we wonder goes, what the urgency is. Maybe that explains it. This goes way past yeah. that. So I, I was just like, I gotta go. I gotta go. Yeah, but that just uh, being, you know, not, uh, you know, not something you would really want to get in. Why would you even speculate toward that? Well, but I, again, just just bringing up that example to just to show. How in medieval times it, it, uh, the speculation just went off the map, and it, it was uh, borderline. I mean, in my opinion, just on the ridiculous. So, uh, well, so let's, and, let's, and let's does, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I mean, it does it does illustrate a major point in the readings uh, in terms of the similarities and the vast differences between humans and angels. I mean, angels dwell in 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 a spiritual realm, and as such, their natural place is without a body. And whenever they do appear to us, uh, they take some semblance of form like this to extrapolate from that, that they have, you know, a whole, a whole history. And, and, and in that occurrence, then they take on human characteristics, you know, bumps up against the incarnation, I guess. But I mean, we can talk about that. 
Yeah. Well, I think that's a good a good point of departure. Let's talk about that. You know, on Wednesday nights, we've been talking about uh this a little bit where we we talked about <coughs> excuse me, uh angels. Even the other night we talked about how Gabriel, you know, comes to Daniel and how amazing it is to think that it was the same Gabriel who hundreds of years later is talking to Mary and talking to uh, Zacharias to tell them about, you know, John the Baptist and about Jesus being born. And, uh, and, and uh, I brought out that how, uh, when we think about angels, it's the word angels is not so much defines who they are in their essence. It really defines their job description. And so uh, angels, messengers, angeloi in Greek, uh, it, it describes what they're doing, but not all angels do that. And so, so uh, how can we say this? Uh, you know, all, all, not all angels, all angels are spiritual beings, but not all spiritual beings would be technically considered angels because there are other jobs right. they're doing. And so I think that gets to the root of what these beings are, you know, they're spiritual beings, but I kind of want to just throw that out to you guys. Uh, what, Let's talk about the creation of them, their nature, their essence, and really just just their jobs in general. Well, I, th I think an interesting point uh, that he raises, and I'm glad he did, uh, is whether angels are created in the image of God. Mm -hmm. um, and he says that they are. I mean, and he cites... Uh, uh, he cites Calvin among others on that. Now there are Reformed theologians that have that have uh, that have disagreed with that, uh, but I, I think Calvin has it right. I think that indeed they are creating the image of God. Uh, there is a different realm, however, between them and us. And again, the Bible is very clear, and the Book of Hebrews particularly is very clear in the fact that even though we were created lower than the angels. And again, I mean, this is a Psalms as well. Uh, we are of God's special interest uh, in the sense that, and this is a, a theme he unfolds here, in the sense that uh, when we, when they fell, it's destruction for you. When we fell, then there's a promise. Your mm -hmm. seed is going to, is going to, he'll bruise your, your heel, but you'll crush his head. And, and there, I think, uh, again, as he talks in the chapter here, I think that that may be a large part of the story of the serpent uh, we see there uh, is that he not only wants to bring Adam and Eve down with him, but he actually wants to destroy them. Uh, it's the beginning of the it's the beginning of the process, the ancient process from before uh, from the creation of the world. Uh, of the destruction of God's of God's elect people, uh, and the project still stands, and his his uh, uh, his uh, rage is is furious. Um, and again, I I think that it helps us to understand a lot in terms of the fact that that ultimately is what he desires to do. Uh, he cannot do it. Uh, he's been uh, he 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 can't because he's uh, by providence been put on a leash, if you will. Uh, but it, it is his it is his uh, his eternal hope uh, is that mankind will be destroyed and, and and again as as we look at current events uh, boy he's uh, I mean in terms of the principalities and powers of the mm -hmm. air and the prince of darkness he's he's got a good run he's got a good run going doesn't he <laughs> Well, let me ask you just a quick question about what you just said uh, real briefly, Marvin, because because I want to hear Will and, and Mike on this. But uh, so so you agree with Calvin that uh, that angels are created in the image of God and man is created in the image of God. And maybe some of those listening would say, well, hold on a second. Uh, there's a lot of difference between us and angels. So yep. would you define what you mean by image of God? and how we both are created in the image of God, angels and humans. Well, I, I think as you, and I, by the way, I think these two chapters are some of the best treatments of angels and demons I've ever seen, uh, certainly in any systematic theology, but I'm thinking just in period and just, and just a, a compendium of them. But in terms of them both being created in the image of God, uh, first of all, we have to note the fact that they are both created beings. Um, 
they did not exist from eternity. Only the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit did. And as such, they are created. Uh, they are creating his image uh, in the sense that they are created in holiness. Uh, they're created with intelligence. Uh, they're created with creativity. Uh, they're created with any number of the characteristics or attributes we can lay off to humans. Mm -hmm. uh, but the fact is uh, that uh, that they uh, are they are created as spiritual beings and the spiritual realm is is their domain so to speak uh, and as such they are not assigned to be ambassador or to be to have dominion over God's created order in other words um, as we see the beginning and I think uh, Beaky Ray uh, uh, points this out as we see from the very beginning uh they are spectators in this uh whenever whenever god says let us make man in our own image some people think that's a reference to the trinity and indeed it is but it's more than that uh because i i think all theologians would agree that it is by this point that the angelic host if we will have been created at this point but in terms of the image of god in us um I don't think, I don't think, I mean, I think that we were created for fellowship with him. Uh, we both, we and angels both were created as, uh, as, uh, as uh, uh, beings that are, are subject to change. But in terms of that special relationship there that we have in the dominion of our, of the earth, uh, it is clear that that is that that is at the heart, that that's at the heart of God's desire. As a matter of fact, we see, as we talked about before, we see there uh, God dwelling among men. We see as we see as His temple among them. I mean, this is a place of His dominion uh, where He chooses to live, not just in heaven, but on the created order on the earth. Uh, and as such, it gives a solemnity and it gives a a, a mandate. Uh, and it gives a great deal of importance to mankind who are created in his image to tend to that. Uh, and as we've talked about before uh, in the other doctrines of actually to extend that dominion over the face of the earth to the point of what, if, what in terms of uh, eschatology, we talk about the new heavens and the new earth. Well, in that probation period of Adam and Eve, we believe that if indeed they had passed the test, that indeed their dominion would have been basically what the new creation would be. And that is an extension of God's glory over all the, over all the earth in, in such a way that it would fill his, fulfill his mandate and God would dwell among men. Okay. Thanks. That's, that's helpful. Will, let me toss it out to you, brother. I'm sorry. The question was, Calvin had said that the angels were created in the image of God. And the question is whether or not we agree with that statement. No, 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 no. The, the, well, we, well, Marvin was, the, the initial thing was we just wanted to talk about the nature of angels, the creation of angels. Oh, okay. And, I, uh, and, and I'm looking form. through the reading and I was like, man, yeah. I, I missed that completely. Yeah. Like, what? The, 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 there, was, there was one small paragraph that mentioned what Calvin yeah. said. No, no, it, it was just simply that that's what Marvin was commenting on, on our initial question. He was just commenting on being made, created in the Imago Day, and his right. point was just and, and, both of us were. Well, and, and let me say quickly, I had my Van Dornian glasses on when I read that. So. <laughs> uh, All right. Well, you know, when I read this, I think there's a, I grew up in the generation of uh, Touched by an Angel. That was like one of my mom's favorite shows that she would watch every Sunday night. Mm -hmm. And so then you, as you get a little bit more mature in your faith, you start to question whether like the reality of a show like that and whether or not that's an accurate representation of angels and their nature. Um, and I really enjoyed one, how they treated first, like just their, even their placement of the doctrine of angels and, and, and demons. And, you know, at the beginning, he talks about how they can be um, placed under the doctrine of creation uh, inner systematic theology or uh, of salvation. Um, but they put it in the doctrine of God 
for divine providence has no instruments mightier than the angels, and God's purposes have no enemies greater than Satan and his demons. We begin with angels who are the nat native inhabitants of heaven where God's glory is openly displayed. So I thought that was great that they explained why they put it in the position of systematic theology that they did. Mm -hmm. And then um, I, you know, I love that they treated honestly this question of whether or not their angels are real and the reality of angels and they went through a beautiful summary of everything involving the nature and character of angels and i think that the summary the summation on page 1121 at the bottom it says in summary angels are heavenly spirits immaterial invisible non-sexual and immortal they are intelligent holy personal and morally responsible servants of god they are the numerous, organized, powerful, and fearsome soldiers of God's army. However, they are created by God and limited in various ways and not worthy of worship. So I thought that was a wonderful summary of the first 10 pages of the book or the chapter that discusses the nature and character of angels. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Mike? Yeah, I guess the... Um... Kind of stole some of my fire there, but even <laughs> sorry, Mike. Uh, no, that's okay. But the we'll, uh, we'll, we'll put you first in the next round. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I do have some interesting thoughts I, on. I, I on feel I, I feel like a prayer meeting on Mondays at your house <laughs> when, when I'm at the end of the line. Everybody else is prayed for everything else. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, with the nature that section on nature, you know, it, it goes through you know the the, the uh, spirits, the servants, the army, the creatures, and how powerful they are and swift they are. Uh, but the key thing too that he, he he you know he drove home is but they are not they are not worthy of our worship uh, mm -hmm. that we should do it, 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 when we start putting our focus on angel we're we're, we're taking it off of God um, we, we our focus should always be on worshiping our heavenly Father and not not angels um, and so um, and I think I don't know if it was in this same, same section on the nature but uh, it, it talked about laying out uh, the uh, putting to bed the myths of angels like do, do does every person have an angel uh mm -hmm. or you know man doesn't become an angel when he dies and goes to heaven he doesn't become an angel right uh, oh yeah. you hear that all the time the time. all the time I, uh, I call it i call it jimmy stewart theology yeah <laughs> <laughs> but uh one thing i found interesting it, it, it did say it talked about uh, angels guarding uh preachers and teachers of the word and I found that I don't think that was in, was that that was in this chapter, yeah. Uh, how that it made reference to the angels uh, during the times when uh, Paul was in prison, how the angels uh, uh, protected him, opened the doors. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I mean, I thought and gave scriptural reference. I, so I thought that was very uh, very interesting. And uh, that was so, Peter, by the way. Peter, Peter. Um. Uh, so. I mean, uh, that's pretty much, I mean, I can go into the, in their works. I mean, they're, they're, uh, they, they, you know, we already said it. They, they execute God's judgments. There is messengers. Um, they protect God's servants. Um, I mean, it's, I enjoyed reading this. Like Marvin said, I'd read Marvin hundred percent. I enjoyed reading these two chapters. Uh, <laughs> And a couple, couple of things that were said in the chapter where we haven't yet moved into caused me to question, and I asked Marvin a question, uh, one of our Monday morning prayer groups regarding the doctrine of, uh, of the Satan and demons. <laughs> hold, hold that question, there, okay? Yeah. Hold that question for yeah. just a second, okay? We'll get we'll get there in uh, hopefully in about four minutes, okay? <laughs> so, uh, boy, we got it. We we got a taskmaster with a whip this morning, don't we? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I'm trying. I'm trying to keep them evenly divided. We'll do thirty no, know, for the but, angels oh, and thirty for the. Good, so, good on uh, you, mate. Good on you, mate. All right. Well, very good. Very good, Mike. Uh, one thing I wanted to bring out is is that our. Um, I think it was our. I think it was at our last Wednesday night study when we were talking about Gabriel. We we in essence just gave a, a very very light general kind of discussion to angels, and uh, and and we were talking about this whole issue about them, uh, you know, angels being the job description and not who they are, and that they are spiritual beings. And we went through some of the other names that these spiritual beings are called. I mean, they're called angels. And, uh, and I kind of opened it up to the crowd and, and of course everyone got, uh, 
Uh, you know, they named cherubim, they named seraphim, but I really appreciated uh, Beaky going through and ba basically doing sort of a mini biblical theology of the names of angels here. Yeah. And on right. page 111, he, he just goes through and I, I won't read everything he says about them, but I'll just read the names. Uh, he gives this under the section, biblical terminology for angels. Uh, there's angel, there's cherub, there is seraphim, there is spirit, there is flames of fire, uh, sons of God, gods. And we've talked about this going through our um, Sunday morning men's Sunday school with, with Matt, where we see that term Elohim over and over again. And it's not, it's not for God. It's not God being, you know, the Elohim almighty God It's for these spiritual beings, the, these other Elohim. And, um, and I think that's important for us to know because uh, until recently, I, I really never noticed that, that I thought, Elohim was God and, and that was it. But but it basically means spiritual being. But again, there's no Elohim that's compared to the Lord Almighty. So there's a huge difference. It's the difference between the creation and the creator, that distance. But then he goes on, you know, there's host of heaven and uh ninth, there's principalities and powers, and tenth, uh, they're given names, and he gives a, the two names that we do see in Scripture, Gabriel and Michael. So I thought that was very interesting. So it's uh, it is really multicolored when you talk about angels and and uh, who they are in their essence. You know, they're these spiritual beings, but they can have different names that really, really sort of gauge toward their different functions and what they do. Yeah, that's so, very good. What what other comments do y'all have about angels uh, before we turn over to uh to talk about one, one last thing the sure. uh, uh on page uh, eleven seventeen the second full paragraph that's a discussion of whether angels are are creating the image of God or not Will and and Mike if if you want to go back and look at that again yeah and we we encourage everyone again as we go through these we're just uh we're just doing a light summation on this. We encourage you to, uh, to, uh, to, to get Beaky's systematic theology. Oh, sorry. That was the alarm for Christian to go feed the alpacas, <laughs> uh, to get, uh, Beaky spiritual theology and, uh, and, and, and follow along with us, read through with us. As a matter of fact, let me just give this quick plug. I was going to give it at the end, but since we're talking about it, uh, we are concluding volume one today, uh, Beaky Systematic is in four volumes. Three of the volumes have already been published. Uh, one more remains to be published. Uh, and we are concluding volume one today. So I would encourage you pick up volume two and pick up with us. Our plan is to do the next three chapters in the beginning of volume two. Uh, for our next time, it will be Wednesday week, not this coming Wednesday, but the Wednesday after that. And so we would really love for you as you, um, listen to us to have read or or be reading this and uh, and you'll get so much more out of this so with that being said let's go over to uh to demons and i think when well, we think about demons, we that if i could just oh, the sure. one thing i really love about this another plug for this book one thing i really love about how um beaky treats systematic theology because i've taken systematic theology as a course at liberty and these Theology books can be kind of dry and boring, but uh -huh. what I love about his book is that he always points at you start with like what it is, and then he always points it to what you do with it. Mm -hmm. And so on page eleven twenty eight, he goes into the implication of the doctrines of angels and mm -hmm. what it how this impl what this implies for us, how we are to worship God alone, how we are to trust God's gracious protection. Because that's mm -hmm. what he gives angels for, in a sense, is to protect us and to protect his word. Uh, through is that we, three is that we keep his commands, and four is that we serve God's lowly people, which is what angels do as well. And so I love how Beaky doesn't just tell us this is what who angels are and this is what they do, but what we should do in light of who they are and what they do and why God has given them to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's Excellent. like every chapter it ends in doxology. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And really that's what systematic theology is for. If, if it doesn't uh, make us want to praise the Lord, then it's not accomplishing its purpose. So 
All right. Well, why don't we please excuse Christian in the background? He has come over to uh to make him some Keurig coffee because the only Keurig the Loomis has owned is over here in the office. So I think he's got like cocoa or something in there, one of those cups, <laughs> little K cups. I see Will shaking his head. <laughs> He said hot Keurig. cocoa pepper. Yeah, sorry, Will. I know that's blasphemy. Not you. coffee. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let, let, let's go to demons. And this is this is something that's just perennially. Uh, Speaking of curing, angels yeah. or demons, right here. There you go. <laughs> this is perennially in our uh, in our cultures. As a matter of fact, I was talking to uh to one of my friends about it that you know we were going to be talking about this this morning and uh and he told me he said that there's a new movie that's come out uh about uh exorcism or yep. or uh Rome. oh you know about it marvin yeah uh, about... it, pre- it probably uh it's it's one of an occasional uh line of these things that comes out uh and um it, it is a rather most of them are rather serious attempts at this, but the interesting thing is most of them are uh, confined to the Catholic Church. In other words, the mm-hmm. Catholic Church really has an office for exorcists, mm-hmm. uh, whereas it's considered probably among those who practice it among evangelicals, it's considered to be really not just a particular office or spiritual gift, but uh, but something that can be well, like like the 70 that can be exercised with some success or not. Um, I mean, that's one thing we saw in the ministry of Jesus is he always, we intended to cast demons out. He did, but with his disciples, we saw that it was a mixed result. And then ultimately he says, these kinds come out only by prayer and fasting. So in other mm-hmm. words, uh, we, it's not a presumption that we make that we have that kind of power over demons. And I think we need to remember right. that. Exactly. Exactly. So good. All right. Well, why don't we go into this chapter and uh, talk about demons? What What was something that really stood out to you all about this? Well, I, I uh, what uh, the um, a couple of things. The uh, the one one thing is uh, I'll start with saying one thing. He went. I, I like the way he uh, went out and and talked about the tactics of the demon. Mm-hmm. And you know the the demons going to attack uh, the the individual believers' trust or faith or confidence in the word of God. That's what he's going out and and he uh, the demon or Satan's goal is the damnation of the of of human of mankind. Right. Um, but uh, going back to the very beginning, he talks about uh, the the fall of Satan. And this is where I was talking with Marvin, and and it, you know it's a good question, and I kind of scratched my head and, and said, "Is he is he saying that?" But on page eleven thirty eight, you know he he talks about um, uh, uh, that Jonathan Edwards considered the king of Tyre to be a type of the devil. If the text does refer to Satan, then it indicates that Satan's fall took place in the Garden of Eden because of his pride. The ugly fruit of that pride was his successful bid to overthrow mankind, God's ruling image bearer on earth. And I thought that was interesting. He's saying that Satan's fall, it could be potentially Satan's fall in the Garden of Eden. Uh, and And I'd always thought, uh, when I was talking to Marvin that say, you know, there, there's other references that Satan's fall was, uh, was not in the garden of Eden. So, I mean, I guess the, my mm-hmm. question is, what do y'all think about that? I mean, is, uh, is that just something that he's, uh, assuming based on a, on a, a hypothesis or is it there for discussion? What do you guys think? <laughs> Well, I don't know. I mean, um, even Beaky says at the end of, at the last sentence in the paragraph, that the text does refer to Satan, then in case that Satan's fall took place in the Garden of Eden because of its pride. Uh, there again, I think there's a, a, a conditional linkage there to that in terms of the hermeneutic or the interpretation of that. Um, I, I frankly don't know. I mean, we do know this. Uh, that the particular manifestation of Satan in the garden uh, uh, with Adam and Eve was such that he walked upright, uh, that he was intelligent, uh, that he was verbal, that he was all the things that in the last chapter we ascribed to angels. 
Um, uh, but again, it, it's clear that his mind worked in a particular way. Uh, he was, he, uh, we can infer from that, rightly or wrongly, that his appearance was not hideous. Now, again, this was before the fall. And, and again, in terms of the, um, in terms of the uh, creation itself, uh, it is interesting because this is the only, the only element of creation, if that's the, if that's the case, uh, that was rational and verbal in that sense. None of the other angels aren't. I mean, they can mock, like mocking birds or parrots or something like that. In other words, they have like uh, probably three or four sentences they memorize and come back w without any understanding. Uh, but it seems in that case then that uh, uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I really don't. I'm, I'm with Mike in a sense, and I didn't. I don't know that I had a good answer to his, his question uh, in the sense that unless this is a two-stage thing, uh, in a sense that we kind of read into it, not from the creation text, but from the other texts, uh, and even extra biblical texts, for instance, the Apocrypha, uh, kind of lends some texture to this as well, uh, that indeed by this point he had fallen. He he had been. The, the only thing I can think about uh, here is that it would have changed his particular situation or not. But I don't know, I mean, I don't know how I feel about this point about uh, saying that that his fall took place in the Garden of Eden. We know that Adam and Eve's fall did. Yeah. But we just, we, we just assumed by this point that, that, he was, that he was insidiously evil as betrayed by his conversation and his behavior. I think uh, Beaky's point was, it's interesting because I hadn't thought about it before, but on page 1139, um, it's, he says, if there was a demonic rebellion and fall prior to Satan's temptation of Adam and Eve, we do not have a record of it in Scripture. Christ's statement that I beheld Satan as, light, as lightning fall from heaven is set in the context of Christ's victory over the devil through the preaching of the gospel. And so from looking at that, it seems that he's taking the point of view that when you look at it from a biblical theology theology perspective and you look at it through the lens of what what do we see first you see first the creation in the garden and then the first thing that you see mentioning a deceiver was the serpent in the garden mm -hmm. and so i can understand his logical conclusion then that that's when the fall took place is after creation while this temptation is going on um, it's interesting. I didn't, I never really paid that much attention to or given that much thought to it. Um, and he also goes on to say that the casting of the devil and his angels out of heaven to the earth in revelation takes place after Christ's birth and exaltation to God's right yeah. hand. Right. The angels that fell into sin found no saving grace from God, but God reserved them for eternal punishment. Well, and it does lend, it does lend some texture to first Peter where he talks about, uh, when, when Christ, uh, when Christ gave up his, gave up the ghost, so to speak, or, or surrendered his life, uh, preaching to the, uh, help me out here, man, the, the, uh, the spirits and the spirits in prison, uh, this would kind of, I think, go along with that as well. In other words, uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, discussion about that. We certainly, one thing we do know is it's not an evangelistic. Uh, the word there in the Greek is kerygma, which is a proclamation, which mm -hmm. would suggest that it would be the completion of this. Uh, that, uh, in other words, when Christ goes and and it, and it, these spirits are sealed in destruction and and sealed in the in the place of darkness, then uh, it's uh, it's uh, uh, I don't know if it's Tim Alvarino, uh, Alvarino or Burton or one of these guys, but he he basically says. Uh, I'm dead and you're not, I mean, I'm alive and you're not, mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm over, I've overcome the grave. This is, this is the, this is the failed fruit of everything since that first deception in the garden. It, everything has failed. And this is the visible sign of that. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh... Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you brought this up, Mike, because I've, I've got, uh, a couple of, uh, question marks in the margin uh, on these sections here. And uh, uh, yeah, you know, when you look at Genesis and 
those first few verses, there's a lot of questions about what what happened there. I mean, you've got, you know, things like the the gap theory that, you know, in between those first few verses, there's a, a huge amount of time in which a lot of these things took place, you know, with, with Satan falling and things like that. Um, but but I, I have to say that that what you just read, Will, about what Beaky wrote here, uh, I, I've never heard that before. I don't think I have, yep. where he says uh, the casting of the devil and his angels out of heaven to the earth in Revelation yep. takes place after Christ's birth and exaltation to God's right hand. Uh, I've never seen that. Basically, um, you have you have Jesus yep. saying this, I saw Satan fall like lightning, and I've always looked at that as, as that being uh, pre-fall. Yeah, you know, me too. Me that too. Happened. Like I was there when it happened. Well, yeah. and I think, yeah, and, and and I think if I'm, I haven't read deeply on this, but I think most most biblical commentators would agree with that interpretation. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting. And I, and I, I was well, actually reading. I'm sorry. Oh, well, I was just going to say real quick, and I've always looked at the King of Tyre uh, uh, analogy as descriptive of how that happened. Right. And so, uh, right. I've always thought that that's just a conventional. Uh, viewpoint of that go ahead will i i was just going to say I, I was reading table talk in their devotions just the other day um and i think they took the view that when jesus said i saw satan fall like lightning from heaven that he was it was in response to the 72 talking about how when they came back and they were like right. people People, we we even the demons are, are subject to us. Like they came out at our command, and they were really excited about it, and that's when he made that statement. And so their view on that was the the person who wrote the devotion and table talk's view on that was he was he was referencing that because of what had just happened just then. So it wasn't like a past tense thing that Christ was saying. Yeah, I was there when that happened. He was saying it as in like spiritually, he's seeing this happening right now. It was interesting. I didn't. I hadn't thought. That's the second time that that's come up in like the last two months from reading this book and then reading Table Talk, and I had never heard of that before, ever. Well, I'll, well, I'll have to go back and study that more carefully then, because again, I, I think we're all agreed on the fact that that that's something we really hadn't considered very much, if at all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and 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 you have to think about it. That there had to be some type of fall uh before that i mean because he right. was the anointed cherub he was lucifer i mean he was basically you would think you know one of the highest uh closest to the the glory of god and all that and so there had to be something that took place between that uh i mean from there to to him i mean something that took place as a result of that, for him, you know, tempting Adam and Eve in the garden. So something happened before Adam and Eve, you know, were there. There was a ministry he had. There was an office he had, a job he had. And um, and then he didn't have it anymore because Scripture says pride was found in him. Mm -hmm. So I guess what we're trying to say is, well, when did that take place? Where yeah. where he, he became an unholy angel and out of that he does what he does he's you know all these things Beaky describes you know the deception the liars the father of lies all these things mike were you going to say something uh, yeah i was going to um with with that it goes back to um with the uh with the uh satan and the demons that the the, the they have the like their spirits too so like like angels they have the same characteristics they they can only be in one place at one time they were very power, powerful and strong um and uh so i i i i, I again i enjoy reading this because uh, but they're powerful and strong but the the thing it mentioned though with um uh, uh, uh where was i just lost my track um, that happened to me a while ago <laughs> hold on I, I got it um yeah, it was. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, the, uh, you know, that, that uh, I'll think of it. I'll go on. Someone else. I'm sure it was I, really uh, good, right? Yeah. Go, 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 go dark and get you some coffee, brother. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I was just to go past just where Mike was referencing um, 
on that same page, 1139, they go on to the kingdom of darkness. Yeah. And that first sentence there, or the first couple of sentences there, I think really struck home because um, I see it a lot. It says, in popular culture, the devil is said sometimes to trick people into selling him their souls in exchange for yeah. supernatural favors. However, the Holy Scriptures teach us the horrifying truth that Satan already rules over mankind. Like, that's the default. Yeah. <laughs> Christ taught that Satan has an undivided kingdom. The Lord Jesus compared the devil's grip on people to that of a strong man who holds his goods securely until someone stronger conquers and plunders him, namely the Son of God. Sinners are the children of the wicked one. Christ said to people who would not listen to his word, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. The kingdom of Satan is not a subset of humanity, but the entire unsaved world. Christ called him the prince of this world. Mm -hmm. that, well, a, uh, uh, that, I didn't hear what you said. Boy, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. And no, no, no. Um, what we do, what we do see in the opening chapters of Genesis is a strong interaction, uh, particularly in Genesis six. And I'm not going to hijack the conversation here, although we should, <laughs> we could. Uh, uh, but 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 again, what you see there is a strong interaction between the natural and the supernatural in terms of fallen deities uh, before, even before the flood, uh, it is, um, uh, depending on how you interpret this, it is, uh, it is such a strong phenomenon that not only is the biblical record there for that, but all the ancient mythologies make reference to it as well in terms of a live interaction with fallen deities in terms of summoning them, having them appear, uh, walking among men and being a major a major player in cultural formation um, in terms of particularly the high places the uh, the the, uh, uh, the pyramids the ziggurats and things like that uh, which is a perverted and a demonic uh, copy uh, of the temple uh, in terms of ascending to God uh, you have a uh, certainly in that place it is such that uh, even in the uh, even in the descendants of those, uh, it, it I think it it lends a, a helpful element in understanding when God looked at out at the face of the earth and only saw uh, Moses and his and his children and their families as righteous and decided to just destroy all of the earth. Uh, I think there's that there's that element of there that not only was it a a, a corruption. Uh, within humanity by these demonic elements, uh, but also of the culture itself. Mm -hmm. Good. What were you going to say, Mike? The, uh, on this uh, section on the kingdom of darkness, I, I remember what I was going to say. I, I can remember when uh, growing up as a child, uh, the times when on Saturday mornings, you, you, you know, we'd sit down during the time I grew up watching TV. What the, the, the depiction of, of hell was, Satan was the keeper of the keys and that mm -hmm. people that went to hell were uh, Satan had him in cells, making him do hard labor and stuff. And uh, he did a good job at debunking that saying, no, that's not the case. Hell is there for the devil and his, right. his uh, followers and, and non-believers where they go for eternal punishment. Uh, so I think that that was good. Was, uh, I, I appreciated how he brought that out. He debunked all the, the things that uh, right. uh, beliefs are things that, you know, individuals believe without going back and doing fact checks. You know, they, they believe what they see on TV. They don't go, they're lazy. And I, that's, you know, right. Satan wants us to be lazy. He doesn't mm -hmm. want us to dig into the God's word and say, right. is that really true? What, you know, what Satan's saying or what they're leading us to believe. I mean, and so we, we, he does a good job. We have to know God's word because we have to we have to uh, battle Satan on this. We have to know God's word, and we have to, uh, as he talks about later in the chapter, we have to know properly wear the armor of God to fight Satan. Yeah. Well, it's a projection. Um, yeah. I, I think a large part of this, in terms of our cosmology, the heavens and the and the underworld, I mean, is vastly uh, is vastly distorted in the sense that. Um, heaven or eternal reward actually comes as a matter, first of all, crudely on the matter of balances of good works versus 
versus bad works and the gross misunderstanding of that, but also of projection of putting their, uh, of our sense of justice and our sense of love in the sense that, you know, mama never went to church, but she was, um, she, uh, I think of Merle Haggard every time I, I turned 21 in prison doing life without parole. <laughs> No one to set me straight, but mama tried, mama tried. Well, mm -hmm. again, uh, there is, uh, uh, there is that element there of the fact that we can't bear, we can't bear that. And so I think it is, a, it, I think as you guys say, it is a fabrication. I think that we do for our own comfort to try yeah. to control it. It's an there's, ultimate form of idolatry. You know? There's yeah. a myth out there in today's society that says that there's, there's a thing of called moral neutrality, you know, yeah. that, that things are morally neutral and then some things are satanic and some things are heavenly. But when you realize if you look at it through scripture, that's not the case that no. you, there are two kingdoms. Mm -hmm. There's a kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. And there is no third kingdom. And you're either walking in the kingdom of darkness or you're walking in the kingdom of light. And until you're walking in the kingdom of light, you're walking in the kingdom of darkness. And I think it's a good thing to think about because it gives us the proper perspective of where we are in this world and and it gives us the right mindset that we're we are at war these are two opposing kingdoms that cannot commingle together right yeah. mm. well and yeah, i, I and, and i think and i think the catholic church is 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 to blame to some extent for that with this concept of condign and congruent merit in terms of uh, as well as you said basically different actions have different weights, not only in terms of consequences, but also in terms of reward as well. Right. I mean, it, it is a sacramentalism gone nuts, which again, uh, it suited the times, but again, we brought that over without the spiritual emphasis and it just kind of adopted that as a standard. You know, there's some works that are neutral. There's some works that are worthy of reward and there's some that are worthy of punishment uh, without really understanding uh, the entire gospel on that. A sacramentalism gone nuts. We need to yeah. get that print on the t-shirt. Well, we got a lot of t-shirts going here, brother. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I just wanted to bring up one more thing. We need to talk about this because I know this is a question probably a lot of people have, and they're wondering, why aren't you guys talking about this? So I want to read a, a, a large part of page uh, 1144, 1145. And then I just want to throw it to you guys for comment, okay? And I'm going to try to go through this as fast as I can, all right? It's talking about demonization. Uh, he says this, Though Satan and his demons have a reigning spiritual influence over all sinners, not yet saved by Christ, there are extreme cases in which a demon takes up controlling residence in a person's body. Such a person is said to have an evil or unclean spirit. He's also said to be possessed by a demon or literally to be demonized. More than one demon can inhabit an individual in this way at the same time. Luke 8, 2, the demon speaks and acts through the demonized man or woman. Consequently, demonized people can exhibit superhuman strength and unusual knowledge, including that sought by divination. However, demonization does not make a person an object of admiration by anyone, but the object of pity or exploitation because of the harmful effects that the demon has upon the mind and body. The phenomenon of demonization in the Bible is especially associated with the coming of Jesus Christ, perhaps as one prong of Satan's resistance to Christ's ministry. And then I want to go over to the other page where uh, well, basically, let me start at the, at the very bottom of, of this page I'm reading. He says, evangelists, um, uh, Philip the evangelist also worked miracles and cast demons out of people when he evangelized Samaria. However, exorcism is not listed among the spiritual gifts given to the apostolic church. Neither do the epistles of the New Testament give instructions for exorcism. Therefore, it is best to view exorcism as a special ministry of the apostles and evangelists directly appointed by Christ. Much superstition revolves around exorcisms. William Spurstow, who was a Puritan, pointed out that Satan is not disturbed by holy water, charms, sacred objects, and incantations, though he may at times make them appear successful in removing a demon in order to spur on false religion. Christians defeat the demons by using the ordinary means of grace, such as the word and prayer, and by walking in evangelical holiness. The ultimate solution to demonization is salvation. 
When an evil spirit leaves a man, but later returns to find the man's life reformed, the demon may very well gather seven other spirits more wicked than himself and enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first, Luke eleven twenty six. To defeat the devil, the soul needs a new resident, of whom we can say, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, First John mm. 4, 4. Comments, brothers? I think that goes back to that strong man metaphor that that Christ used like there is a strong man that holds people in bondage until someone stronger comes and is able to tie him up and defeat him and and that's I think what we're seeing here once Christ takes hold of your life that's the only ultimate way to be rid of demonization Mm -hmm. well and I think that's an important point because of the fact that Again, I mean, I remember when I was in college in the 70s, uh, that's about the time Linda Blair came out with the exorcist and that whole, <laughs> yeah. uh, that whole thing. Uh, pro- uh, Mike and Van, you're probably old enough to remember that, Will. I mean, you're probably just a, uh, probably just a thought in your parents' mind at that point. But, uh, but again, I mean, that started a whole fascination with this uh, in terms of that. And I remember that it percolated through particularly among young people in terms of a, a fast we talk about a fascination with angels this was a fascination with demons even to the point where we had some guy down on the first floor of our dorm that was casting demons out of a hair out of a hair dryer mm. <laughs> uh, b- believing that it was demon possessed i mean it was just it was just nuts but again i think fundamentally as you guys have said uh it, it all comes down to the spiritual battle between yeah. christ and devil and again uh, the spiritual battle in terms of uh, in, in terms of redemption and salvation it means nothing apart from uh, temporarily uh, uh, temporarily throwing bad influences out as represented through deep speed deep seated demons or spirits like that uh, if it does not if it if, if it is not uh, if it is not linked and chained to the gospel itself um, uh, Moral reform is not what we need, and a new birth and a new heart is what we need. And where, and I, I think in the passage you you just read there, I think uh, Beaky just is spot on there in terms of identifying that. Really, as the secret, um, that is the true that is a true source of of the defeat of the defeat of Satan. Uh, mm-hmm. And again, it is the the fulfillment of the proto evangelion in in Genesis. Uh, in terms of the gospel and in terms of the uh, the freeing uh, freeing of captives and, and that particular power that the gospel does have. Mm-hmm. Excellent. But hold on one second, Mike. I got to say this. When you talked about Linda Blair, I mean, that, that, that took me back. I mean, unfortunately, uh, back in my high school days and even a little after that, uh, uh, I like I was really like a movie watcher. And of course, you know, yep. if you like that, you know, if you're a guy, you like action movies, but if you're, you know, you usually like scary movies too. And so I, I would, I would watch them, but what the thing I wanted to point out is interesting. This, I haven't thought of this for a long time, but did you, do you know RC Sproul watched nightmare on Elm street or at least he knew I, about it somehow, because I forgot I what not. book it's either in his book, the holiness of table God. Talk? <laughs> Uh, no, it's holiness of God or either chosen by God. I'm, I'm, I know it's one of those two. He talks about Freddy Krueger in there. And I was like, what in the world? This is crazy. So I have to go back and look and see if I can find it. Uh, yeah. I, uh, Ed Fontes, brother, back to the sources. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, Mike. Yeah, I just, uh, two things I that, that I highlight and put stars by way. So I was reading it, <clears throat> but bottom line, how did they defeat the demons by you know, grace, the word, word, the word of God in prayer and yeah. walking in holiness. The, the other thing that, so I found, the, that I found interesting was that because you see all these movies, again, it's culture trying to, to plant false um, beliefs or, or in our minds. But uh, we, down at the bottom of page 1144, exorcism is not listed among the spiritual gifts given to the apostolic church, neither do the epistles of the New Testament give instructions for exorcism so i mean to me that that so to me what that says is uh we as uh, as christians as brethren we need to stay locked in the word of god uh, knowing the word of god and praying uh for 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 individuals uh that that uh that are um 
uh, said to be possessed or that are, that are that are that are sinful. They're living in darkness. I mean, that's 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 the way I read all that. To me, it just says there is no exorcist um, the right. office. Uh, there is no office of exorcist uh, in the current church today. Yeah, as in the Catholic Church has one. Church, yeah. But 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 it it does raise the question. Uh, is casting out of demons something for this day? In other words, it, it, it is it possible and is it a reality in the sense that we see it in the Gospels? And what I read, uh, what what I read Beaky to be saying is, uh, if it is, it's of no consequence. But he really doesn't believe that it is. And mm-hmm. Marvin, w- would that not be, especially within the Reformed Catholic Church, uh, the uh, the ultimate? rope dope right? Yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> right. Mean, that's right. They look like he's being defeated, but it, all yeah. the while it's his strategy to win, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He could take a lot of blows. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, I want to wrap it up by by just uh reading what Beaky says here on Satan and the sovereignty of God. And then I'll throw that out to, to you guys for one last closing remark and then we'll uh, end our time together. But I think when we think about this, we we have to keep this in mind. I think this is the the, the overriding principle here. Beaky writes this. He says, although Satan rules over this world, he does so as a limited creature. Christians must not succumb to an ultimate dualism in which God and Satan are two equal but opposite eternal powers acting on the same level. The devil and his demons are fallen angels created by God and still subject to his decree and providence. A demon has no power to do anything unless his being is preserved by God, his action permitted by God, and the result decreed from the throne of God. I think that's excellent. Gentlemen? Job. Job, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think uh, I love that, and it, it kind of ties in with the end. Again, the practical implications for the believer um, on page 1148 it says, resist Satan's schemes. And Beaky says, it is our duty, therefore, to know Satan's tactics, to keep watch against them and to resist them with all our might. Thomas Brooks said, Christ, the scripture, your own hearts and Satan's devices are the four prime things that should be first and most studied and searched. And he goes into talking about Satan's schemes. And then he goes into, the, I, I think, one of the best expositions on the armor of God I've read. Mm. so far and most of it comes back to that reminder of god's sovereignty that mm. christ is our christ is in charge christ has defeated satan and that god is sovereign and ruling over all of it and he uses that illustrated through the different pieces of armor and if if um i would really commend this chapter to um uh, everyone because this is this is an amazing chapter that talks about the reality of what we're fighting against and how to fight it. Mm-hmm. Well, and I, I think, I think in the footnotes, he mentions two books here. And I know, I think Van would agree with this in terms of, uh, Gurnall's the Christian in complete armor. I mean, it is a massive tone, which by the way, that, I think that, that book makes this look like a baby book. <laughs> it, it does. It does really. It does really, uh, give a shout out in, Chattanooga, Tennessee, to McKay's used books. And uh, uh, basically, I've just, every time I go to Chattanooga to visit the kids, I go there. I mean, I got a, I think I got a used copy in, in practically new condition of Grinnell for like nine bucks or something like that. Oh, my. Uh, I got W. Robertson and Cole's uh, Expositor's Greek New Testament. I, I got that, the, the three, three volumes for, again, they're in good condition for probably like 20 bucks. Uh, but again, Excellent, and Van, I know that for the uh, for the spiritual warfare part of uh, Ephesians, I know this has been part of your preparation as well as mm-hmm. going through Gurnall. The other one is uh, talking about Thomas Brooks' precious remedies for Satan's devices. Um, marvelous, marvelous work. So, too. That, Excellent. Uh, yeah, and you the, can get that one in a little Puritan exactly. paperback. So, yeah. uh, if you don't have time for Gurnall, get yeah. that one. And who does? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, Mike? No, I just uh, think that uh, the, uh, the way he put it, the re- reminding that, uh, that God, God uh, that Satan's powers are limited and God, you know, God is sovereign, God is supreme. And that, um, that, 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 
again, that, that, that we need to put our trust and faith and confidence always in God and, and not worship, mm-hmm. not worship the uh, Satan. Um, uh, he, he ties into this, you know, God hates mankind. He's jealous of mankind. So therefore he wants mankind to be brought down. He wants mankind to suffer the same. He wants, he wants, I guess, uh, misery wants company. So Satan, uh, I guess another way of saying it, he wants as much company as he can because he knows he's content, condemned to damnation and he wants a lot of company with him because mm-hmm. he's jealous of mankind. <laughs> that was the whole start of the temptation, wasn't it? Certainly is. So, all right. Well, guys, thank you all so much. Uh, I hope for those who, who might listen to this, that it will be edifying to them. And why don't we close in prayer? Will, could I ask you to close us in prayer, brother? Sure. Father, thank you for you know, this time learning about angels and, and demons and God. More than anything, our takeaway is that you are sovereign over all of it. And God, help us to trust that. Help us to not be distracted by worshiping angels, uh, but to focus our worship on you. And Lord, uh, help us to understand that you are sovereign over every power or principality that would seek to deceive us. Lord, help us to be aware of it. Help us to battle them rightly, and most importantly, help us to trust in the finished work of Christ on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Well, thank you all so much. You guys have a wonderful day. And uh, for those listening, we hope to uh, be with you all again in two Wednesdays from now.